Good evening, brothers and sisters. Happy to be back together today. Um, this morning we had a good time. It was a, a good time with uh, this special day for, uh, for, for us. And uh, we had a good time of fellowship. We had a good time worshiping the Lord. We had a good time uh, of hearing His voice, His word. And uh, we're going to do it once again uh, this evening. And we're going to worship Him because He deserves it. He is our God. He is our only one and true God, and we want to worship Him and spend some more time together and doing, do, it, do it together. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank You because we know that You are here once again. Every day, every time we uh, gather together, You are here. We know it because You said it. And so uh, we ask You uh, to bless this moment that we're going to spend together. Please welcome our uh, thanksgiving that we want to give you through these songs and we also want to hear what you have to tell us and we want to be blessed and we want to bless you uh, for this evening and we thank you for that be blessed and thank you for tonight amen
Praise the Lord. We're going to share a couple of announcements here to get going. And uh, it's so good to have all of you with us tonight to be able to join us in our worship service. We're just believing God to do His work in us uh, and, and through His Word. As we worship Him, let's allow Him also to speak to our hearts and lives. I just want to start off here real quick with uh, our tithes and offerings, the three different ways that you can give to the church. Obviously, there's a fourth way. If you come on Sunday morning, you can give your offerings at that time. Uh, another way is through our online giving at chowfirst.com backslash give. You can give online that way. You can drop also your tithes and offerings off at the church Monday through Thursday uh, at the church office between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Sister Kimberly is, is usually is here during those times, and so you can do that, or you can mail it in to our P.O. Box 248 Chowchilla, California. And those are the different ways that you can participate. The announcements that we have, I uh, just want to share with you the very first announcement is the, uh, is the, uh, the Humboldt property renovation project that the, we're, we're working on. Uh, we have a goal of $7,500 to raise. We've raised around uh, $5,200 right now, and so there's around $2,300 yet to be raised in order for us to, to keep complete this project. And so if you haven't been able to give as yet, would you prayerfully consider how the Lord might use you uh, to help us with this particular project? Uh, we're moving ahead. Things are making progress. And we hope that uh, uh, by the end of November, everything will be put together and we'll have everything completed at that time. Um, Wednesday morning is the women's prayer group. Uh, if you're available, women, come and be a part of this. It's on the church playground. Uh, and uh, there's a, a time of a fellowship uh, a time of prayer uh, for needs that are specific uh, to the church and also specific in your life. So we invite you to come and be a part of that. Wednesday evening, Royal Rangers and Impact girls are going to be meeting at 6 p.m. on the playground for the girls on the Humboldt backyard for uh, the Rangers. And so we invite you to be there and, and, and to bring kids, invite children, invite young people. If you have your grandkids or whatever that don't have anything to do, this would be a good opportunity for them to come and to be ministered to and to have a good time. Uh, also, Wednesday night we have our Bible study at 6.30 p.m. right here in the sanctuary via online, Chalchilla First Assembly of God, our Facebook page. And uh, Pastor Mikael is going to be sharing uh, again on the topic of love for God and fear of God. And so we invite you to be a part of that. It's going to be uh, a blessing for all those. It's al already been a blessing and we're going to continue uh, to receive from God's word. Uh, don't forget that next Sunday is our in-person services. We're going to be, uh, let me go ahead and get go forward here. Uh, we have, okay, there we are. I got someone back there helping me out, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Thank you, brother, Pastor Mikael, for helping me out there. Um, so we have the Sunday school at 9.30 a.m., and then we have morning worship, out, uh, outdoor, uh, in-person outdoor morning worship service at 10.30 a.m., and so we invite you to be a part of that. We had a great time today. We had a great uh uh, time of fellowship with a meal after after service today, and uh, so we're we're thankful, we're, folks. We're going to keep on marching ahead through this and just believing God to do His work in and through us. Uh, we're not going to let up and we're not going to give up. We're going to keep on moving forward uh, as we're facing all these obstacles that are set before us for church gatherings and all that. Uh, not uh, this coming Friday night, but the the twenty third of October. We're going to have a family movie night, and we're going to be showing the film Courageous. It starts at 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We want to invite you to come. Invite a friend. Uh, you can see Brother uh, uh, Randall or Sister Kimberly for the, uh, where you could pass out particular flyers that address this particular evening. Uh, it's to reach out to the community as well as to be a blessing for the body of Christ. It's, it has a double function. And so we invite you to come and be a part of that. That, again, is on the 23rd of October. Um, let me just share something with you. Uh, this week I was able to uh, download and print off uh, certain items that were given to us regarding uh, the district of the Assemblies of God's response to all that's been happening here. And it has been a change, a uh, challenge, I should say. It has been a challenge for all of us to know what to do, how to do it, and how to have an impact. And the answer they ask several questions on this document that I have before me. And as I'm looking, here we go. They deal with the theology of faithful disobedience. 
They also deal with the question of constitutional issue, issues arising from, an effect, uh, from or affecting the decision uh, that we are going to make because there's decisions that churches are making already. The effect on the church's witness in the community and the legal issues and liabilities that the church and its leaders may incur. And so these are the four questions that they answer in, in four different documents. And the one that I, I was looking at today, the very last, the very last uh, sentence of this document, a nine-page document, it says simply this, the remedy to COVID, division, economic difficulties, and disaster, talking about the fires, the floods, the hurricanes, is not found in a vaccine or the ballot box or the treasury. The remedy for all these things is found in widespread repentance and return to the Lord. Widespread repentance and turn to the Lord. And he talks about in this particular document, this here answers question number three, the effect of the church's witness on the community. It talks about the necessity of having an attitude that glorifies God, having behavior that glorifies God, having a message that is clear, simple, and relevant. And also, uh, in talking about this, keeping our message centered on Christ. You see, folks, I'm not a politician. I'm called to be a servant of God. And some of you would like me to be more political, and I understand that, but that's not what I'm called to be. Now, I will state my case on issues. I will state my case on, on looking for those people that represent who we are. I get that. That's, that's part of it. But I'm not going to use this pulpit as a political pulpit. That is not my calling. God's called me to be a purveyor and a communicator of this word. And that's what I'm called to do. And so, would you pray with us that God would work and move? Our, our county is in the throes of a... Uh, of uh, we have Fresno opened up, we have Merced opened up, and Madeira smish, smushed right in between those two, and we're still closed. And part of the reason for that is because the statistics are taking in every inhabitant in the county, including the the state prisons that we have here just outside of Chowchilla, and they've had quite a run of COVID there at the prison, and so uh, that augments or increases. Our, uh, our statistics here for the county of Madeira. And so let's just be praying and asking God to work and move. Folks, and I'll share this with you again. You know, it's, this has probably been one of the hardest times in our ministry that I can remember. Living in Haiti was difficult. I mean, it wasn't easy, but you could minister freely. But living there was difficult. Uh, just the, the lack of electricity, the, the poor conditions, and, and all that. That was difficult. But this time... So on top of that, all that we're experiencing in a worldwide sense, and then also the political issues, the social issues, and everything that we're facing as a country, it has become a very challenging time. And with God's help and with his grace, we're going to make it through this. Now, there might be some things that will look different on the other end of all this. I don't know how that's all going to pan out and how that's all going to work out, but would you pray for us when I say us myself and the leadership team of this church, that the Lord, the spiritual leadership team of this church, that the Lord would enable us to be able to uh, discern his purposes and his plans. We need your prayers, folks. We can't do it without you, and we're asking that you would be with us. Uh, it took a little bit longer because I really felt like I needed to share these things with you uh, tonight, and we're just going to believe God to do his work in a powerful way. And may God touch lives. Like I said, it's not... It's not, it's not the election, it's not a vaccine, it's not somehow an economic boom that's going to change our nation. It's a heart transformation that can only happen through Jesus Christ that's going to bring about real and lasting change. So let's continue worshiping the Lord now as we move in that direction and praising his name and giving him the glory that he so rightly deserves.
that confession on our mouth that you are Lord tonight we come to you Father God trusting you to do your work in the hearts and lives of your people Father God Lord I pray for our brothers and sisters who are part of this congregation that are struggling in their physical health Lord we've been praying for Brother Kenny and I thank you so much for all that you've done for him we've seen that tumor shrink from being a massive tumor on his on his neck to being just a little tiny bump and and God I'm so thankful for that the Lord he has on uh, again further procedures that uh, he'll be starting some pretty heavy duty treatments this week Father God that will last a total of four weeks with observation and and things of that nature and God I just pray that you would be with our brother and that your Holy Spirit would work and move in a very powerful and very real way in his life during this time Father may his light so shine And may his faith in you be so brilliant and bright, God, that others would see Christ in him, the hope of glory. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with Esther, his wife, as well as she is there accompanying her husband and helping him through this time, that your spirit would be there and give strength. God, I know that you're able to do it, and I ask that you would in your precious and holy name. Father God, continue to work in Barbara's life. God, you know her circumstance, you know her situation, you know what she's struggling with in her physical body, this cancer that she's been battling. By your stripes, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would heal her. In Jesus' name, in your own name, Lord, reach out to her and continue your healing work in her body. And Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue working in a very real and powerful way. Lord, as we received the request this week of Brother Kenny and Sister Esta's granddaughter, a five-year-old Bree, who has had a heart surgery, Father God, and it went well from the last report that I have received, and, and God, that this little one is recovering. I just pray, Father God, that this little one, that your work in her physical body would bring about a complete and total restoration. God, bring her, Lord, to complete health again, or to complete health. I don't know her past. I don't know where she's been. But Lord, bring her to complete health, I pray in Jesus' name. Father God, I thank you for Sister Tammy. God be with her tonight. May your spirit encourage her and build her up in her most holy faith. May she believe you for a healing of, in her body. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch Nicole. Again, praying for the Marsh family, Brother Kenny and, and Sister Esther. Father God, their daughter-in-law, Nicole, had a seizure, fell and hit her head and Lord has been in the hospital for a long time Lord I pray for this young woman and ask that your Holy Spirit would work she's not just a a wife but she's also a mother and and God I pray that you would restore her in Jesus name that you would somehow in her brain restore the damage and God that she would be healed and restored for your name's sake and for your honor and glory in her life and through her life Father God, I believe you're a God of miracles and you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we ask or think according to your power at work in us. And so, Father, by faith, with those who are listening in tonight and those who are present here in this place, Lord, we agree together for a healing for Nicole in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work and to move in our country. God, I pray that as we are approaching Election Day, three weeks from this Tuesday, God, may your Holy Spirit, Father, work throughout this land in the name of Jesus. We need you, Lord. And God, as Christians, help us to maintain the light of our testimony. Your word says we are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. 
We're not to hide that light under a bushel, but Father, we're to be brilliant about our testimony for you. And it is my prayer that you would help us to be that way. In the way that we communicate, the way that we talk, Father God, may we in Jesus' name draw people to Jesus and not to us or to our own opinions and ideas, but to Jesus, because that's where the answer is. And God, for our own stay here in California for Madeira County, I pray somehow, some way, Father God, that we would be able to, to begin meeting once again in our congregation, in our church building. We need your grace and your mercy to manifest itself in our hearts and lives. We thank you for who you are, Lord. Let your name be praised and magnified. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. I want to thank the worship team for leading us before the throne of grace tonight and lifting up the name of Jesus. And uh, we have a new member to our worship team. We have Brother Robert, who is helping us with rhythm alongside of his wife, and we're so thankful that he has been willing to do this. God bless you, brother. I know he's not looking for that, but we're thankful that he is participating. And so I'll let you guys go ahead and go down. While they're going down, I just want to uh, say what a privilege it has been for us to have our friends with us, Kevin's and uh, Natalie uh, uh, Rhino, in French they would say Rhino, and uh, they have been with us since Friday evening, and uh, I had the privilege, along with Cynthia, uh, to, to be part of a pastoral staff. I wasn't the senior, senior pastor, I was helping a French pastor, and her family was in that church in a place called Arles, A-R-L-E-S, France, down on, the, down on the southern part of France between Marseille and Montpellier, not quite on the Riviera. Between Arles and the Riviera, there was a place called the Camargue, a big, marshy, swampy area. And they had probably 100 billion mosquitoes there for every human being on the planet. I mean, it just, uh, anyhow, it was a great experience to be in Arles. <laughs> but more importantly than all that was the people that we had a chance to meet. And our daughter, Ruth, was with us there, along with her brothers. And uh, Natalie and Ruth became uh, good friends, and have if, am I correct? Attended each other's weddings and stuff like that. Wow! Uh, and so this is this has uh, been an ongoing relationship, and uh, oftentimes we have we've had a chance while we were still in Europe to visit with her family, her parents, and I didn't realize this. Kevin's um, before he came to the United States to to pursue the job that was offered him in Livermore. He works at one of the laboratories. I'll just say that he, is, uh, he has a high level of education working in the nuclear industry. And uh, he, uh, he was a worship leader. And he led the worship in his church that he and Natalie attended in Bordeaux. And as we were talking today, he was sharing with us that uh, he was responsible for 40, or not 40, 30 different musicians and singers. And they would rotate in and out for worship services and stuff like that as well as he himself leading worship. And, and he writes songs, songs for the glory of God. And, and uh, since he's been here, God has given him some English songs, and he has written them. And he is going to come right now with Natalie, and they're going to get prepared to share this song uh, with you. I think it goes well along with the message that the Lord has placed on my heart to share with you tonight. But again, uh, before they head back to Livermore and get on in the routine of their lives in the days ahead, uh, I'm so thankful, first of all, that you all stayed. Because <laughs> they were planning on going back this afternoon, but they, they decided that they would stay and honor me in this situation to, to sing this song. And uh, just in the little time that we've had, I've grown to love and appreciate them uh, in a greater way. And this is my first time meeting Kevin's and... Uh, you did good. You did good, Natalie. <laughs> I'm proud of you, girl. <laughs> Anyhow, so I'm going to turn it over to them and get out, of, get out of their way and just let the Spirit of God minister to you as you're listening to them uh, worship the Lord.
Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for sharing this beautiful song with us. And continue writing, not just in French though, also in English. <laughs> uh, he gives and takes away, but blessed be his name. And that is our attitude and that's how it should be as Christians. Would you take your Bibles with me and prepare? We're not going to read it immediately, but go to uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 in your Bibles. <sighs> the message that I'm going to share with you tonight, the title of this message is called To Live is Christ. To Live is Christ. And I would like to introduce it in this way to you tonight. A woman in India watches as her sister is dragged off by Hindu nationalists. She doesn't know if her sister is alive or dead. A man in a North Korean prison camp is, take, is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious. And the beatings begin again. A woman in Nigeria runs for her life. She has escaped the Boko Haram who kidnapped her. She is pregnant, and when she returns home, her community will reject her and her baby. A group of children are laughing and talking as they come down to their church's sec uh, sanctuary after eating together. But instantly, many of them are killed by a bomb blast. It's Easter Sunday in Sierra Lanka. These people don't live in the same region or even on the same continent, but they share an important characteristic. They are all believers in Jesus Christ. And they suffer because of that faith that they have in Jesus. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as this. As any hostility experienced as a result of identification with Jesus Christ. From Sudan to Russia, from Nigeria to North Korea, from Colombia to India, followers of Christianity are targeted for their faith. They are attacked. They are discriminated against at work and at school. They risk sexual violence, torture, unrest, and much more. Just in this last year, over 260 million Christians living in places that live in places around the globe are experiencing high levels of persecution. Let me repeat that. 260 million Christians. Now the population of the United States is between 300 million and 320 million, right, or 330 million, right in that ballpark. We're almost talking about a country the size of the U.S., people spread throughout the world that are experiencing persecution. Last year, 2,983 Christians were killed for their faith. 9,000, uh, 9, excuse me, 488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked and many destroyed. 3,711 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. And these are the ones that they were able to count, not mentioning all the other ones that were not counted. When we look at these numbers here, it's heartbreaking. And yet they do not tell the whole story. In James chapter 1, verses 2-4, through 4, the Bible says, Consider it all pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That joy is what we see with Christians all over the world who suffer because they serve Jesus. God cares for His people and He will never leave or forsake them. What I just shared with you came from a website that I would encourage you to look up. Opendoorsusa.org it it's, a, it's, a, it's a website that deals with Christian persecution. And, and uh, it shares testimonies and, and miracles of deliverance and a lot of different things. Another website that I went to, according to the beliefnet.com, belief as in the word I believe, but beliefnet.com, it says these trends 
make sense for many American Christians. Persecution of religion, of their religion, only happens in faraway countries. It happens out there, but it doesn't happen here in our nation. Right? Isn't that how it is? Wrong. You see, Christian persecution is happening right here at home on our own soil in the U.S. Many are attacked for their faith too. While it might not be at the level of beheadings or burning down churches as seen in other places of the world, it's still a problem that is growing in our nation. Traditional Christians are facing increasing intolerance in this country through fines, lawsuits, jobs lost, and public disdain that they feel coming from other people. Whether it be political persecution in the halls of power, intellectual persecution on, in our country's universities, or in our public schools, or be it economic persecution through lawsuits and jobs lost, American Christians are increasingly faced with persecution right here in our own land, here at home. In recent days, there have, we have seen Bibles burned by radical groups like BLM and Antifa. They have called for the overturning of our political system and our cultural system in favor of a communistic system that makes the masses subjects and slaves of the power brokers in our country. That being the politicians, the billionaires, and the criminally minded, the woke crowd. Politicians and judges have been grilled. Those who have, who have run for office, political office, and judges that have been uh, vetted to become a judge in a certain court, they have been grilled for their religious beliefs and made to feel that they are unworthy to serve their country because they believe in Jesus and follow Him faithfully. Point, point uh, to consider is Justice Amy Barrett right now. They can't find anything on her, so they're lambasting her for her faith. Folks, I wish I could say that it's, it's going to get better. But the Bible says that towards the end of times, if they hated you, they will hate me, Jesus said. And we're seeing that happening in our world. Christian students and teachers find themselves under constant scrutiny for their faith and are often told emphatically to keep their beliefs to themselves or suffer the consequences of public repudiation, expulsion, and or losing their jobs for those who are professors or teachers' assistants. As Christians, our hearts are broken and angered to see our great nation plunge into the depths of moral decadence and political corruption. That was so, so much pointed out to us this morning in this morning's message that Pastor Mikael shared with us. The descent into idolatry and the end game is complete moral decadence. You do whatever you want to do with your body. There is no right or wrong. There, uh, it's an unbridled sexuality in every perverse way that you can imagine. And folks, we're there. We're there in this land. It grieves my heart when I see young people who can't even identify who they truly are. And having adults tell them that if they believe they're a cat, they're a cat. If they believe they're a dog, they're a dog. If a man who is 56 years old believes he's a six-year-old six girl, he's a six-year-old girl, and a family can adopt him as a child, as if he were a child. And we have people, adults, doctors, PhDs, we have psychologists, we have psychiatrists, or, uh, psychiatrists, we have all these individuals who are saying, that's good when it's in total opposition to God's created order. What can we do? What can we do with all this? In the face of such persecution, we who possess a true and living faith in Jesus Christ, we need to heed the words of the Apostle Paul. For me to live is Christ. For me to live 
is Christ. There is so much temptation to be sucked into the philosophy and mindset of what's going on in this insanity in our nation. It's there. How many people who just a a few years ago would have said, no, that's wrong, and today, oh, that's cool, that's good. We've changed our opinions. We've changed our ideas to match that of the world. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, that your mind would be conformed, not to the world, but be conformed to the Word of God. You see, today, we're living in a time, and you must be careful, we must be careful as believers in Christ not to fall into that slippery slope of idolatry where we create a God in our own image rather than following the God that gave us His blueprint for life in the Bible. This book tells us who God is. It's not some theologian who lives in his ivory tower at one of these uh, seminaries like Harvard Seminary or Princeton Seminary. Yes, those schools are called universities today, but at one time they were seminaries and they still have schools of religion on the inside. And uh, Theology is just simply the study of God. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who studies God or the idea or the concept of God is a true believer. And they continue, and, and, and brother, you shared with me that article and, of a supposed theologian who was saying that people who are not pro-abortion really don't know what they're talking about. It's taking this word and basically ripping pages out. We don't need that, don't like that, and we choose to make God who we want Him to be. In order to placate our our or chase away what we would perceive as guilt and condemnation. Don't condemn me is the mantra of many people. Don't condemn me. A woman living with a man that's not her husband who says she's a Christian, don't condemn me. Don't judge me. But Paul says judge righteous judgment. Judge righteous judgment based upon the book and also Obviously, when we talk to people who have fallen spiritually, we do it in a spirit of meekness and gentleness, not in a spirit of harshness and critical. The Bible is very clear. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, the spirit of gentleness. You see, folks, the temptation today is to mix it all together. And I think that's maybe... We have to be careful because in the church, are we serving more than just the God of the Bible? Are we serving also gods that we have fabricated for ourselves? Like the Israelites did in the book of Judges. And that slippery slope from from creating an image to represent God. When God says, don't create any images for me. And then... We create an image in our minds. And then we begin to embrace other things like Hinduism and Islam and this and that. Coexist. Have you seen that bumper sticker on the back of vehicles, on the windows? Coexist, all these religions. Just grab a little bit here. It's like a smorgasbord of religions. You just pick and choose what you want, put it all together, and that's good for you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The Word of God in John chapter 14, verse 6 is very, very clear. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. Now I'll be reading out of the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible uh, will have some expansion on the meaning, so it will, will be able to give us a little bit deeper insight into what Paul is saying here, uh, a, a little bit, Uh, deeper understanding. In verse 21 it says, For to me to live is Christ. He is my source of joy, my reason to live. And to die is gain, for I will be with Him in eternity. 
So for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 22, if however it is to be life here and I am, I am to go on living, this will mean useful and productive service for me. So I do not know which to choose if I'm given that choice. Verse 23, but I am hard pressed between the two. You see, Paul is in prison at the time of writing this letter to the Philippian church. He's in house arrest at this moment in time. He's chained to a Roman soldier all the time. So it's not like he can just get up and go wherever he wants. He's in that type of environment and he's wrestling in his spirit saying, boy, to live is Christ. He wasn't going to change who he was going to serve and honor. But he was thinking a lot about heaven at that time. He's thinking a lot about the reward in heaven. Folks, I know sometimes as we come towards the end of our lives, we should be thinking a little bit more about heaven. But, as I've said before, the Apostle Paul had served the Lord and had traveled and had ministered at this, by this time over 30 years as a missionary, traveling the Roman Empire. And so he's, he's experienced so many different things, but he's remained faithful to the Lord. And he says, if I live... It's for Christ. If I die, it's to be with Him. Wow. His example. So he's hard-pressed between the two. He says, I have the desire to leave this world and be with Christ, for that is far, far better. Yes. How many times some of us have thought, Lord, you can just come get me. (laughs) Can you just rapture me? Or Lord, can you just come and get me? with all the stuff that's going on in the world? Even so, like John the Apostle said, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly at the end of Revelations. And sometimes we get to that point in life where, Lord, please, sooner than later. Sooner than later. Verse uh, 24, Yet to remain in my body is more necessary and essential for your sakes. You see, Paul is deciding at this point in, in time, at this junction in his ministry, he's, in, he's being held as a prisoner in house arrest, under house arrest, attached to a Roman soldier, and there at this particular situation, he is struggling with, do I go, or do, I, do I wish to go? That's far better. But then, his heart for the churches and the believers that God has used him and others to plant and develop, says, no, it's It's more profitable, it's more necessary and essential for me to remain alive for your sakes. Verse 25, since I am convinced of this, convinced of the fact that the Lord wants me to remain, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So your rejoicing for me may overflow in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Powerful. Listen, I'm convinced that God wants me to, to hang on. And we know that, that Paul was ultimately released from this imprisonment and that he found himself during that time, some people believe it was at that moment in time when he made a trip to Spain. Now these are all conjectures. There's not any solid evidence. But he expressed his desire to go and to visit the, 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 the country of Gaul, which at that time represented the, the Spanish uh, area. Our French brothers and sisters might argue with that, but anyhow, that's what that's what people were thinking to go to Spain. In this particular situation, Paul felt that God had work yet for him to do for the body of Christ, and he wasn't going to give up, and he wasn't going to throw in the towel. He wanted to be available. You see, he never retired from ministry. He never retired from ministry. He was forced into retirement in a dungeon at the very end of his life. And even then, he was able to write letters and send letters out to the churches and to individuals because he loves the body of Christ. He loved the body of Christ. And his whole goal 
was I want to see you progress in your faith and, and in the joy that the faith in Christ brings. And I want you to overflow with rejoicing when I come to see you again. Now he's talking to the Philippians here. He's talking to them. And then he goes on to verse 27, Only be sure to lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I do come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit and in one purpose, with one mind, or that word mind can be translated one soul, striving side by side, as if in combat for the faith of the gospel. He's encouraging them. Lead, lead your lives. Live your lives in such a way that is worthy of the gospel. Folks, we're called to be witnesses and testimonies in this world to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that we're not perfect. I get that. Steve knows that he's not perfect. There are issues that I deal with, things that I have to take before the Lord. It could be an attitude, it could be uh, a thought, it could be actions. Whatever it is, there's times I have to go to the Lord, like all every believer does, when we have failed, and when we have sinned, and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. But the encouragement here is that we need to live in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Not living in this world of in-between or creating a, a, a God that is not the God of the Bible and then saying that we are followers of Christ when the Christ that we follow is not the Christ of the book. You know, it's interesting. A Catholic man said to me, now uh, I say Catholic, uh, most French people uh, at a particular period of time, not all, but a lot of them had some uh, influenced by the Catholic Church. They were either baptized into the Catholic Church as children, uh, maybe they did confirmation, and then they were, you know, they went through all that process that they go, go through in their first communion and all that. And this man had not followed the Catholic Church for ages. And he said to me one day, we worked out together in the same gym, and he said to me one day, and I think we went out and got some coffee with another guy that I had met there, and we were just talking about different things. And he said to me as we were parting ways, he said, you know, I have a Bible, and I've read the Gospels. He says, I like the Jesus of the Gospels. I like the Jesus of the Gospels. It spoke to me that a lot of times people who profess Christianity have no idea who Christ truly is. The church has made him into whatever they've made him into, and they walk in ignorance and darkness. Unless they have the word. I gave a Bible to a 40-year-old woman who had been in the church since she was baptized as an infant. 40 years old, and I gave her her first Bible. And faithful, not just on the holidays, but every weekend, doing Mass, doing confessional, doing all that. And I gave her her first Bible. She had been told that they were incapable of understanding what was written in this book. And I thought, wow, Lord. A lot of people live in ignorance, even though they profess Christianity, because they have not been presented the real Jesus. That's the reason why we need to live our lives in a way that will bring glory and honor to God. We need to strive together, stand firm. And I'll go over that in a moment. And verse 28, And in no way be alarmed or intimidated. Ah, this is key. And in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponents or your adversaries, your enemies. For such constancy and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign, a proof and a seal for them that their impending destruction, of their impending destruction. We need to stand firm. We do not bend and we do not become like them. We stand firm, not in obstinacy and arrogance and all that, but in true, genuine faith in Christ, no matter what they say to us. A man was on the streets of, of I think it was either Minneapolis or on the streets of Portland, and he was witnessing 
Now, he wasn't on the main thoroughfares where all the rioting was taking place. But he was, he was on, a, uh, on sort of an off street where people were sort of like a pass-through street that people were going from one, from one part of the right to the other part of the right or manifestation or protest, whatever. And he was, he was talking about Christ and their need for Jesus. He's a young man, too, in his 20s. And he's communicating Christ. And the people were jumping into his face. They were getting all over him. They were cursing him. They were doing all that. And yet... He even had stuff dumped on him, all that type of stuff. But he continued to be faithful to what he felt the Lord wanted him to share at that moment in time. That's part of the hostility that we're facing in the world today, where people don't want anything to do with God. And thus, and thus, because of that, there will be a day when they stand before God and they will receive the judgment of God, just like the people and judges who had refused God and then were judged by God. It's interesting that Paul says, and God turned them over to. Three times in Romans chapter 1, God turned them over to. Those who refused to believe the truth, he turned them over to the lust of their flesh and all the subsequent consequences that, can, that come with that. Verse 29, let me go on to finish verse 28. But a clear sign, when you live your faith and when you say you don't become alarmed or intimidated by your enemies, by our spiritual enemies, but a clear sign for you of deliverance and salvation and that too from God. Having done all to stand, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, having done all to stand, stand. Continue. Now, if the church last month, we had the chance to have a family uh, movie night out in the, in the playground area, and we watched Facing the Giants. Now, it was a football theme type of film, and it was done well, and I really, I, I coached football, I enjoyed it. But there was this one exercise where the young man was blindfolded, and he had to carry another fellow uh, uh, teammate on his back. Now, he was a big guy. He was one of the linemen and defensive guys. And he was supposed to, to carry him on his back for so many yards. And the coach was saying to him, have you given all you got? Have you given all you got? The team was struggling that year. They had already lost a couple games. And it looked like it was going to be another fail, failed year. Have you given it all you got? And so he's, he's thinking, oh, okay, maybe I can go 30 yards. And the guy's on his back, holding on. I, it's not like riding a horse. They, they, they're back to back, and somehow they're able to stay balanced. And he's, he's doing what we call a bear crawl. No knees on the ground, arms and feet, and that's it. And he's crawling. And the coach says, you can do more. You can do more. You can go further. You can do it. And when he's done... He says, have I gone to the 50-yard line? And he said, take your mask off. You're in the end zone. A hundred yards carrying a 180-pound guy on his back. He did it. You see, sometimes in our lives, it seems so heavy and so hard to continue to press forward in our faith in Christ. We feel the weight of everything that's going on. We feel the weight and the opposition of the enemy on us. But God is there to give us the strength that we need to continue remaining faithful to Him. You'll have family members. The Bible says that, that Jesus said to His disciples, and He says to us, that within our own families there will be members that will hate us for what we believe. And they'll say wicked things, and they'll say hurtful things. Stand strong in the Lord. And don't lose your faith because of what someone else says. Hold fast to your faith in Jesus Christ. You see, what we're facing in this world today is a persecution that is only going to get worse for Christians. Unfortunately, I wish I could say in some of the documents that I've been reading that our district has, has made available on their website, as I'm reading those, and they're saying, it doesn't look like it's going to get better. 
So we have to adapt and ask God what He wants us and how He wants His church to move forward in the midst of all this. Verse 29 says, For you have been granted the privilege for Christ's sake not only to believe and confidently trust in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And verse 30, and so you are experiencing the same kind of conflict which you saw me endure and which you hear to be mine now. He's in prison. When he was among them, those of Philippi, among the uh, the Philippine Christians there, as he was there, he was thrown into prison. He was beaten. And they're in the inner prison. They're in the stocks. And he's saying that, prevent them from moving. And Paul says to Silas, his traveling companion, he says, Silas, let's worship God. Now, if it had been me, I'd have said, Paul, you sure? Because I sure don't feel like worshiping God right now. I'm not in a very comfortable position. And they begin singing praises to God. They begin to honor Him and glorify Him. And as they're worshiping the Lord, the earth shakes the doors open in the prison and God performs a miracle. The the jailer and his family are gloriously saved. The start, really the the, the first major family salvation taking place at that moment in time along with the ladies that they had ministered to alongside the river there who had heard the gospel and believed. And this jailer, those people made the foundation of a church that during their day had an impact on their world. They helped Paul do the work of a missionary. They sent him offerings. And Paul mentions that here. Thank you so much. My God can supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. That's what he says to him after he has commended them for giving sacrificially so that he could communicate the gospel elsewhere. Oftentimes, we like to quote that verse without the context. The context was out of a generous heart of the people for the work of God that Paul could say with confidence, my God shall supply all your needs. He shall supply all your needs. The main truth that I I, I hope to leave with you tonight is simply we need to stand firm in Jesus when faced with persecution because of our faith in Him. We need to stand firm, unshakable, unmovable. I've talked about this at various times in various types of sermons that I have preached. But there is a necessity to remind us once again, because folks, this is, it, it, it's like a drippy faucet that just tink, tink, tink. The enemy is, is, is coming at us day after day after day with what we watch and what we hear, what we follow on the internet, on television, and, and all that, and he's coming at us like a drippy faucet, and it's driving us insane. If we get our focus off Christ and get it on the circumstances that are taking place. You see, we need to stand firm in our faith in Christ. And if persecution should come to us personally in our own lives, and many of you have experienced persecution from family members and whatever, uh, really, in a way, uh, basically considering you dead among them, that you're no longer alive and they no longer have contact or communication with you. Some of you may have other things that you've gone through. Maybe you have been censured at your school as a teacher. Maybe you're a student and you have been ridiculed and mocked and made fun of. Oh, you're a virgin? I, I can't believe that. You know, we're not living in the... Stone Age, you know? All this type of stuff that goes on. All the type of persecution that we could experiment as a believer, a follower of Christ. We need to stand firm. Paul's attitude towards life and death was simple. To live as Christ. To live as Christ. He is my source and my joy. He is my reason to live. Paul's desire was to live a life productive and useful for the kingdom of God. And that his life would have an impact and the lives of others. That was his heart. That was his passion. That was his desire. He desired to live that way, to produce much spiritual fruit in the lives of followers of Christ. 
And Paul believed that his living was more needful for the church. So his idea towards life wasn't, Lord, this is a miserable life. I don't want to live anymore. Now, folks, he'd been beaten. He had been stoned with, with rocks. Left for dead. He had been shipwrecked. He had experienced many difficulties. Been in prison. Been beaten. All these things. And he says, it's more needful that I remain for the church. Yes, to face more persecution and more suffering. But he did it gladly. His attitude towards death was, if I die, it's a gain. If something happens to me, I'm with Christ for eternity. You see, we don't have to fear. Paul's earnest desire was to be with Christ. And he expresses that. He knows that his life is not dear unto himself. He's not out there doing things haphazardly. He's just simply going about the Lord's business. When I was in Haiti and the, the country was under manifestations and people were being shot and killed uh, all over the place, every day as I got, uh, I needed to get up and I needed to go to the Bible school and I had to drive through parts of town that were dangerous. And I remember looking at my wife and my kids and telling each of them before I left, I love you, not knowing whether a stray bullet might have my name on it or or a mob or a crowd might attack me. And I remember I just felt I have to do what God's called me to do without living in fear. My life and my times are in His hand. In His hands. I am no hero. <laughs> I am no hero. I just know I had to do what God called me to do and trust Him with it and trust my family to Him. Or times I saw bodies on the road, another body being not dismembered, but you could see the marks where machetes had cut the, 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 the skull and had cut the body, and they were dead. You see people who, alongside of the road, and, and one person had been shot, another one had been murdered, obviously murdered both of them, but one with a gun, one with a machete, and, and all this type of stuff going on, and I'm thinking, God, I, my trust is in you. My trust is in you. We may face that type of day again here in our own country, here in America, and even in Europe. For our friends who were with us in Mikael, Pastor Mikael and his family, we may face persecution where people will come at us or things will happen, dangerous circumstances and situations will arise. Are we going to be willing to say, Lord, my life is in your hands. I am not my own. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live and to serve the church was Paul's passion. He wanted to be used by God to have an eternal impact in the lives of other people. Brother Randall, what you do with, with Royal Rangers and Brother Rick and and, and, and Sister Lynette and, and Sister Joy and, and others who are involved in working and ministering with children is not in vain. It is not in vain. Your life may be the only Jesus that they will experience. Live it. With all the, the energy that you can for the glory of God so that those children's lives will be changed. This coming weekend, our Royal Rangers are going to be going to a camp. And I'm praying that God will touch some. That these young men, some of them don't know, really know Jesus. I mean, Brother Randall and, and Brother Rick and, 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 and one of the fathers, Mr. Morey, come and they, they are working with them. And I'm so thankful for these men's dedication. But some of them are still haven't quite got it, haven't quite understood it. Fully. Some have, but not all. And I'm praying that during this trip, God will touch. Maybe God will call one of those young men to serve him and to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus, work and move. 
to live and serve the church? Is it our passion? Now, the church is not just the building. It's, not, it, it's the body of Christ. It's serving the body of Christ in whatever way we can with the gifts that God has given us. Paul exhorts us as well. As he shares his attitude towards life and death, he exhorts the Philippians and he exhorts us today in verses 27 through 29. Our lives should be lived in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Our lives should be characterized by the following. We need to stand firm in one spirit and one purpose. We need each other. Linking hands or linking arms in a spiritual sense. That we stand as one in the faith, encouraging and believing our brothers. There's not any of us that are better than anyone. We are standing side by side moving forward and allowing God to do His work in our lives. We need to stand firm with one mind, with all of our heart, soul, and mind, with one mind, that we make this book our daily food, and that we are in one mind in what God's Word is saying to us, and not to be all over the planet with our thoughts, to stand firm in one mind. We are not going to lose faith. That's the reason why it's so important for us to be together. And that is why the enemy is fighting so hard to keep us apart at this time and at this juncture. Listen, if you're deciding not to come to church because it's more convenient for you to be at home in the comfort of your own home, just let me say this. I love you. I love you. I love you. But you need your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need that personal contact. You need today to see the brothers and sisters sitting around the table talking to one another, mutually encouraging one another, finding out about how things are going on. You need the body of Christ. Well, I'm fearful of COVID. Folks, our lives are in His hands, and we are not our own. Trust Him. Trust Him. As we stand firm in one spirit and in one mind, in so doing, we need to strive side by side, as if in combat for the faith of the gospel. It means we need to support one another. The Bible says if you see a brother who's weak, you who are spiritual, you go to him, not even necessarily one who is sinning, but someone who is weak in their faith. Maybe they've just been beaten down by life and circumstances to shore them up. We need to fight together. It's like having a wounded soldier, for those of you who have been in the military, a wounded soldier next to you. Now, he's still trying to fight on because he still has his hands and he still has, but maybe he's been shot in the leg or he's been wounded. And, and, And we're fighting side by side. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, when they face difficult circumstances in their lives, they have issues with family. It's not fun to have a family say, You're as if, it's as if you never existed in my life. That's not fun. Because of your faith in Christ. And maybe you've known someone that has been rejected by their family like that. I've met people like that. And I've seen both uh, in Quebec and, 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 and in America, my dad was rejected by, thankfully not by his brothers and sisters, but by his stepmother, completely written off as if dead because he didn't follow the way that she thought he should follow. Because he was a believer in Jesus Christ in a personal relationship with him, not in a religious sort of way, but in a real sort of way. Our lives are to be lived fearlessly when those who oppose the gospel endeavor to intimidate us. Don't let people intimidate you because of the gospel. They might ridicule you. They might be up in your face. They might be hollering and yelling at you like we have seen on television in recent days. But don't let anybody intimidate you. And do not, do not respond like the world responds. Be like Jesus. Because people were up in his face. They were spitting at him. They were cursing him. The Roman soldiers were pulling out his beard. 
And Jesus did not react. He's our example. We need to be fearless. And our lives should be lived with the realization that to embrace Christ is not only to embrace eternal life, but it's also to embrace suffering for Christ. Verse 29. It is not only being given on our behalf to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for His sake. To suffer for His sake. Suffering, we don't like it. I know I don't. I know I don't. Sister Cindy stubbed her pinky toe this week and it was like four shades of deep purple. You know, I'm like, I can only imagine. She's, she's got a high tolerance for pain. After four kids, she better. And a high tolerance for pain. But I could tell it was bothering her. And I was backing up. And I'm, I'm a little guy, you know. I, I don't take up much space. And I was backing up. And she happened to be behind me. And I didn't see her. And I stepped backwards. And I think I missed your toad. Did I? Hallelujah. Because if I hadn't, whew, we don't like suffering. We don't like experiencing things either psychologically or emotionally or physically. Suffering. But if you live for Christ, the Bible says that these things will come. Whether it be a baker in Colorado or a photographer in Arizona or someone somewhere else that chooses to stand firm upon their convictions, a county clerk in Kentucky who says that she's not going to sign the wedding certificate between a man and a man and a woman and a woman and the persecution that she faced and the loss of her job. Standing firm for righteousness, God will take care of us. The last thing is simply Paul. Paul's example is to be a source of encouragement for us to hold fast. God used him in a difficult situation in Philippi to establish a church. He was imprisoned, and as I've already shared, God mightily delivered him after a moment of persecution and suffering. Paul encourages us to hold fast during our trial of faith, as he did and was even doing at this particular time, writing to the church in Philippi. Persecution for those who follow Christ is unavoidable. Jesus said that the world would hate us because it hates him. It's unavoidable. Some people will say, I don't want to be your friend because you're a Christian. I'll share with you a situation. I was, my, my kids were playing basketball in France, and they, they have sport clubs there. They don't, they're not attached to the schools. So after school on Wednesday was the big day where kids could go in the afternoon to these sports clubs, and my sons played basketball, and the French really like basketball. It's definitely one of their sports. It's not just soccer, but it's also basketball. And they would have different athletes. They had, a, they had a, uh, uh, a track and field club, and they would come in and do the exercises, work out in the weight room and stuff like that. And, and the coach was older. He was in his 50s. At that time, I was in my 30s. And <clears throat> we'd get to talking, you know. And he found out that I was American. And, and we did this for a couple of weeks. Not real long conversations, just short here and there. And then one day he asked me, so what are you doing here? I said, I'm a pastor in a Protestant evangelical church here in Lone Sassonia. Oh, that's what he said. Oh, he turned away and walked away from me. For weeks, he did not say hello. He did not say anything to me. I just kept going. I worked out with the basketball team, the city basketball team, the adult basketball team, young guys, and I was 39th, thinking I was young. And just having a good time, shooting around and practicing. And one day he came up to me again, and he reopened the conversation. Not necessarily about asking me about God, but he reopened the conversation. Why? Because he saw me every week, being consistent, bringing my sons, being involved, not condemning or judging anyone, but living faith before them. Folks, it's, it's, it's a part, and sometimes it's not easy. We struggle with a sense of rejection sometimes. 
And God help us. And I have to pray because I have a tendency, believe it or not, to be a timid person in one-on-one contact with people. Until I get to know them, my son Joshua is the same way. Until we get to know someone, then we feel at at ease. But just in one-on-one contact with strangers, that is very difficult for us. But it's through relationship and continuing to persevere in certain relationships that God gives us opportunities to be able to witness to His grace and His mercy. Because the world will hate us, we need to stand firm in Jesus when faced with persecution because of our faith. So we must understand, as we approach the end times, that persecution against Christ's followers will continue to intensify, not just overseas, but here at home in the United States. Our attitude should be that of the Apostle Paul, to live as Christ and to die as gain. We are not to live, it, let me just say this, no, rather, we are not in a lose-lose situation, but rather in a win-win situation. Because to live is Christ, and to die is to be with Him. We are in a win-win situation. We might suffer, we might go through hardship, but it's a win-win situation. I'm not going to take the time to, to, to read this final text here, because it's quite a few verses but I would like to encourage you to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, where it talks about what the persecution and the trials of our faith, what it does to build us up to become stronger and more purified in our relationship with God and with those around us. Folks, there's going to be a day. Oh, that song, that old song is coming back to my When we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When I see Jesus, what's the rest of it, sisters? We'll sing and shout the victory. What a day that will be. Hallelujah. Let's pray. I want to pray for you. And as you're there at home, maybe you're struggling, maybe you're going through difficulties, keep your focus on Christ. To live is Christ. And to die is to be with him. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter what trial we might be having, what persecution we might be living, keep your eyes on Jesus. Father, I thank you so much for your people, for your church, and it is my prayer, Father God, that you would work and move for your name's sake and for your honor and glory. God, you know where we're all at, and you know what's coming down the road ahead. And it's not, gonna, it's not a shock to you. I know for us it might be a shock. But Lord, if we keep our eyes on you and on your son Jesus Christ, you will help us to be able to go through the trials that lay ahead. The persecutions that lay ahead. We don't know how this is all going to pan out in the days ahead regarding the pandemic and the election and this push to move our country away from anything or any idea or concept of God, people using religion as a, as, a, as, a, as a shield from devious and unholy and ungodly things. And God, I just pray that somehow, some way, your Holy Spirit would help each of us to do what we can within the constitutional boundaries that we have in our nation, to vote, to speak out, but Father God, most importantly, to represent Christ to this world because in the end Christ is the answer Christ is the only answer and God I pray that you would work in our lives help us to be lights lights in the darkness thank you for your faithfulness in Jesus precious name amen and amen May the Lord bless you this week. We're not going to conclude with a song today, uh, Sister Cindy, because we've gone over just a little bit on our time. But uh, one thing I like about the Facebook thing, you can go back and watch it and worship. Anytime during the week, you can go back and worship with the worship team, uh, the songs that we have sung on Sunday morning, Sunday night. And so I would like to encourage you to do that. If you need a lift, worship. If you need to, uh, to be buoyed in your spirit, worship. And uh, we provide CDs, still provide CDs for those who have need of them because uh, they don't have access to the internet. 
and uh, we have songs and things of that nature, and I want to encourage you, uh, if you would like to have CDs or you know someone who could benefit from having the CDs, let us know, and we'll get them some. We love you folks. We appreciate you. May you have a great week in the Lord. May His Holy Spirit be with you and guide you and direct you. And uh, don't forget about the activities throughout the week. I'm not going to take the time to, to, to repeat them. You can find those on our Facebook page, uh, What's Going On. Uh, be blessed this week. and May the Spirit of God just make this, in this time of trouble, the best week that you've had thus far. We love you folks. God bless.